Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja and I am Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. In this course of Law of Contract, we will be moving on to session number 5 today and the lecture is on capacity to contract. You can see on your screen the topics which would be covered in today's session. We will be starting with discussing uh, section 11 of the Indian Contract Act 1872. Then moving on to who is a minor. Thirdly, section 12 of the Indian Contract Act 1872. Then who is a person of unsound mind. What do we mean by disqualified, the phrase disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject. We will proceed to discussing what is the nature as well as the effect of minors agreement. Then doctrine of restitution in minors agreement and we will be concluding this lecture by discussing liability for necessaries supplied to the minor. To start with the concept of legal competency to contract, you will wonder that the session is titled as capacity to contract, but we are starting with legal competency to contract. So friends, when we say capacity to contract, we are actually referring to legal competency to enter into a valid contract. So in our previous sessions, we have discussed about the essential elements of a valid contract under section 10 of the Indian Contract Act. So one of the main requirements or the essentials of the act under section 10 is that the contract should be between two parties who are legally competent to enter into a contract or what we say capacity. They are legally capable to enter into a contract. Now what do we mean by legally competent, legal capacity, legal capability? It has been described or it has been explained under section 11 of the Indian Contract Act. But let us see what, uh, what is on the screen now. So it says competency to enter into a legal contract is one of the requirements under section 10 of the IC Act that is the short form for Indian Contract Act only. You will be seeing this uh, short form further in this, in, the, in this presentation as well. Remember in the previous session I had referred to three C's. So while discussing the essentials of valid contract, I had informed you all that there are three C's which one has to keep in mind. So out of those three C's, one was capacity, other being consideration and consent. Now capacity, uh, competency means capacity to enter into a contract under law and section 11 is the relevant provision of the Indian Contract Act which emphasizes upon or which states the essentials of legal competency to enter into a contract. Uh, again I am telling when we say legal competency or legal capacity, we are trying to say that the competency as has been laid down in the law. Because law says every person is competent to enter into a contract provided that person has attained the age of majority, is a person of sound mind and is not expressly disqualified under any law to enter into a contract to which he is subject. Minors, so if we come to the crux of section 11 because our today's lecture is revolving around section 11, section 12 and few other provisions from the Indian Contract Act as well as specific relief act. So friends before we proceed further, I would just like to make a very important point here that is so when we say that Indian Contract Act deals with the general principles of contract, it tells you about the definitions, tells you about the validity of contract, performance of contract, what will happen if breach of contract takes place, what is the remedy available. So in reference to remedy, I would like to tell you and it would be reflecting in our today's session also 
that when we talk about remedy, remedy is not something which is just restricted to uh, Indian Contract Act here. So, in relation to contract, if a breach occurs, if dispute occurs, Indian Contract Act is not the only legislation which provides for remedies in such case. You will see that reference is also made to Specific Relief Act of 1963 as well. So, yes, uh, moving back to section 11. Section 11 in a way in nutshell says minors, persons of unsound mind and persons disqualified by law to which they are subject are therefore legally disabled from contracting. You will also find this uh, terminology written legal disability to enter into a contract. Legal disability. Because this, this uh, the law, there are certain uh, provisions or certain factors mentioned in law which lead to such disability and those people are not in a position to enter into a contract. Yeah. So, next we will be moving on to the definition of minor because as we said minor, person of unsound mind and disqualified under law. So, we will be discussing these three things one by one. And then we will proceed to the effect of uh, minor's agreement as well as the nature of minor's agreement. So, who is a minor? To start with, you can see I have highlighted that the term minor has not been defined under the Indian Contract Act. It is true. Now, in fact, the Act says uh, in, in section 11, it says a uh, person who has attained the age of majority is competent to enter into a contract. So, obviously, it means that uh, in contrast to it, we are trying to say that a minor is not capable to enter into a contract or minor is legally incompetent, if I may say. But who is a minor is not expressly mentioned, defined, explained in the act. But as you can see on your screens, the governing law is the Indian Majority Act of 1875. Now, you have to keep this thing in your mind that you will come across many legislations wherein the term majority the term minor uh, will be used, but there are two situations which you have to understand. First is that that statute, that legislation itself may mention the age. Say for example, Hindu Marriage Act. Hindu Marriage Act clearly mentions that if two Hindu, uh, two, peop, two Hindus who are to get married, what is the respective age? So, that age is mentioned there, right. But Consider a situation like the Indian Contract Act, wherein only this thing is written that person should have attained the age of majority. But what is that age of majority? For that, reference will be made to Indian Majority Act of 1875. Now, in general, we all know that whenever we say person, I mean, person should be a major, should not be a minor, generally we know that uh, it is 18 years of age what we are mentioned what we are referring to but let us see what section 3 of the indian majority act highlights it says the age of majority is considered to be 18 years there is only one exception when court has appointed a guardian for minors person or property but and in such cases the age of majority is 21 years right so, in general, the age of majority is 18 years as per section 3 of Indian Majority Act. But in this one case, in this one exception, it will be 21 years. That exception is when the court has appointed a guardian for a minor. Now, guardian is, what is the purpose for appointing a guardian? Guardian is appointed to look after another person or his property or both. He or she, that is the guardian, assumes the care and protection of person for whom he or she is appointed as the guardian. Now, which is the law which governs this aspect? Because uh, Indian uh, Contract Act is not telling you as to who is a guardian and how is a guardian appointed, why is a guardian appointed. But the correct law or the uh, relevant law which tells about the appointment of guardian by the court and who is a guardian, what purpose does the guardian serve? The relevant law is, as you can see on your screens, Guardian and Wards Act of 1890. Now, moving on to the next 
aspect which has been covered under section 11 in competency to contract that is person of unsound mind. So, it is telling you that a person who is of unsound mind is legally incompetent or incompetent under law to enter into a valid contract. So, it says agreement of person of unsound mind is void under Indian Contract Act unlike English law where it is voidable. Now, in our first session we had discussed about definitions and we had covered till uh, contract and void agreement, but we did not cover the concept of voidable. It will be covered later on as well, but just to tell you briefly what exactly is this term voidable. Now, voidable means that say for example, a person has committed a fraud against you and has made you into entering uh, into a, in a contract with that person, right? misrepresented some information, made you believe something and you believing in the truth of it, he intentionally deceived you and you got deceived and you entered into a contract with that person, right. But later on, you got to know about the reality and you are no longer willing to continue in that contract, right. So, voidable basically says, when you have discovered that fraud, you have two options. Two options, the first option being you have a choice to continue. You have a choice to continue in the contract and uh, let it be even if the fraud was committed against you, you have come to this realization that this contract ultimately will prove beneficial to you. So, if that person is getting more benefit, you are also getting benefited. So, you are okay with it and you wish to continue. The second thing is, the second option in your hand is fine, now I have discovered that that person committed fraud against me and if he would not have committed that fraud against me, maybe I would have uh, not entered into such kind of a contract with that person. So, that second option gives you a choice to step back and do not perform any obligation under that contract, right. So, voidable basically means you are getting two options, wrong has been done against you, so, you have two options either to continue, no problem, I am okay with it, I live with that or the second option is exercise your right and uh, say I do not wish to continue and I do not wish to perform any obligation because you did not act in a correct manner. Now, let us move on further, section 12 of the Indian Contract Act, you see the, the systematic arrangement of the provisions. Section 10 states that persons should be legally competent, section 11 tells you who are competent to enter into contract and section 12 describes as to who is a person of sound mind. What do we mean by when we say person of sound mind? It is section 12 states a person is said to be of sound mind for the purpose of making a contract if at the time when he makes it, he is capable of understanding it and of forming a rational judgment as to its effect upon his interests. If I may explain it to you in a slightly uh, uh, simpler manner, I would just try to tell you this thing that see what has to be seen is when that when a particular party is entering into a contract with another party, is that party capable of understanding the nature of the contract, the terms and conditions involved in the contract, what will be the consequence of that contract, will the terms which have been mentioned in the contract hamper the interest of this party, right. So, this is what we mean by rational judgment, rational judgment means this only that you are able to understand what is right for you, what is wrong for you and you know what is the nature of the act you are doing. Now, section 12 is not limited to this part only which you can see is in quotes, but it also goes on to say that yes, as a general rule, a person has to be what is seen as person is of sound mind that is capable of understanding the nature, the consequences of the contract or the transaction in which he is entering into. But apart from that, further than it says, there may be two situations. First, person who is usually of unsound mind 
occasionally of sound mind may make a contract when of sound mind see when we study criminal law also uh, your uh, indian penal code of 1860 which now has become bhartiya nyay sanhita 2023 they are telling you this thing that basically there there is uh, a chapter related to general exceptions which we also identify as general defenses now there is one of the aspect covered uh, under those general defenses which is of insanity whenever we teach that concept to students we always tell them that there is a difference between legal insanity and medical insanity medical insanity may mean that uh, the person is suffering from mental uh, issues mental health is not proper mental capabilities are hampered right legal disability legal uh, insanity if we say what we are saying is see a person may be suffering from medical insanity but if the condition of that person is such that there are times there are intervals there are periods when person is in a position to understand everything and appreciate the nature of every act that person is doing or what is done to that person if in that particular situation a person does an offense he will be held liable he cannot take the defense of insanity because when that person committed the act irrespective of the fact that person is medically pronounced to be insane but when that person did that act he was very well in, in his senses that is exactly the principle which we follow under the contract act also it says person may be of usually unsound mind but there would be those bouts those intervals when he is capable of understanding the nature of contract the nature of transaction in which he is entering into and if in such circumstances a contract is entered into by that person with another person it will be a valid contract right and similarly then the second aspect which has been covered is person person usually of sound mind but occasionally of unsound mind may not make a contract when of unsound mind we simply are trying to say that see there may be occasions that person is usually of sound minds but that person gets fits gets certain uh, during certain intervals that person becomes incapable of understanding what is or are his interests and may take some step which he would not even be able to appreciate has happened in such situation if any such kind of agreement is entered into it is not valid in nature it will be void these are two examples two illustrations from section 12 which have been highlighted which are there on your screens if we just go through them one by one it starts with a patient in a lunatic asylum who is at intervals of sound mind remember we just saw here person usually of unsound mind occasionally of sound mind may make a contract when of sound mind so a patient in lunatic asylum who is at intervals of sound mind may contract during those intervals because during those intervals he is of sound mind a sane man that is a person who is usually of sound mind may be delirious from fever or is so drunk that he cannot understand the terms of a contract or form a rational judgment as to its effects on his interests because excessive drinking obviously it hampers a person's mental capacities mental capabilities and in that situation if a person ends up entering into contract or signing any document it may end up proving lethal against that person's interests because remember one of the most relevant important requirements of a valid contract is that it the parties have mutually agreed to the terms of the contract or what we had discussed consensus ad idem agreeing on the same thing in the same sense so a person who is so drunk pissed drunk that he cannot understand the what is happening around him or uh, uh, what is even written on that paper and just ends up signing that document may prove lethal against him against his interests there is one judgment i have highlighted here uh chako versus mahadevan it's a 2007 judgment of supreme court wherein supreme court has observed 
that unsoundness of mind is finding of fact. So what do we mean by this? It means that whether a person was of sound mind at the time of entering into a contract or not is a question of fact. What do we mean by is a question of fact? When we say it is a question of fact, we are trying to convey that it will depend or it will differ from case to case. It will depend upon the facts or circumstances of a particular case. This is what is meant by uh, finding of fact. In this case, valuable land sold for paltry amount that is very, very less amount which, it, which, did, which uh, did not justify the cost of that property. Now, it was proved through medical certificate that person was suffering from alcoholic psychosis. Supreme Court ended up setting aside that sale deed. Now, the third aspect, the third aspect covered under section 12, that is persons disqualified by law to which they are subject. So, the third aspect as stated under section 11 of the Indian Contract Act, certain individuals are legally barred from engaging into contracts and therefore are incompetent to contract. That is apart from minors and persons of unsound mind, there is this another category which says that there may be under any other law or any, any other legal rules, a person may have been declared to be incompetent or uh, not capable of entering into a valid contract. Certain examples which we can see uh, of those uh, people who are legally disqualified from entering into a contract are alien enemies, convicts, insolvents, can be foreign sovereigns as well as ambassadors. Now the Indian Contract as Act is not uh, stating these uh, examples or is not mentioning that uh, this is the restrictive category which, uh, which is being referred under section 11 or when we say disqualified uh, by law, we are only referring to these categories. These are few examples, few examples which I have mentioned here. Now, a person serving sentence in jail, that is a convict, if he ends up signing some contract during that period, it is void in nature. It is not valid. That means neither he nor the other party would be under any kind of obligation what would not be under any kind of legal compulsion to fulfill the terms. Now then it says A who belongs to say a country X, herein I am telling you about the concept of alien enemy. So A who belongs to X country places an order with B who B for certain goods. Now B belongs to a different country. B is a person who belongs to another country named Y. The goods are shipped, but before they could reach their destination, X country declares a war with country Y. And now the contract which was entered between A and B will become void because for A now, B and then vice versa as well is an alien enemy because his country is in a state of war with another country. So, this person who is from another country becomes the alien enemy and alien enemy with an alien enemy you cannot enter into a valid contract. Now, coming to the most important aspect of today's session under capacity to contract that is nature of minors agreement. Now, remember in this, in the last uh, session dealing with consideration, we had clearly seen that if we refer to section 23, we refer to section 25, they are in a way stating that agreement without consideration is void, right. So, the fate of an agreement which is devoid of consideration is void, yes barring few exceptions, but in general I am saying it is void. But nowhere in the Indian Contract Act it, is it mentioned that what will happen or what is the fate of a minor's agreement. So, if there is no written law on it, yes, minor is incompetent to enter into contract. But what will happen? What will be the fate of it? Will it be void? Will it be voidable? What exactly will its uh, uh, final destiny be? But, and obviously, therefore, 
there were uh, clashes of uh, clashes in the decisions which were being given by high court on that point because some high courts were of the opinion when they interpreted the law that such agreements will be void in nature some meant to the extent of saying that they are voidable in nature so there was no consistency no uniformity in relation to this interpretation of law now then in that situation crisis situation if i may say came this judgment of 1903 which was given by judicial committee of privy council in the landmark judgment of mohari bb versus dharmadas ghosh it was the first judgment which made it clear that a minors agreement was void ab initio what do we mean by ab initio void we and no void means that it is of no value in the eyes of law what is ab initio ab initio is a latin uh, word latin phrase which means from the very beginning so it is of no value in the eyes of the law from the very inception itself general presumption that every man is best judge of his own interests is suspended in case of minors this is the reason it was held that minors agreement is void ab initio because minors category minor is a person who is not in a position to take care of his interest to understand that what is good for that person what is bad what is in his interest what is against his interest so that's why in mohri bb it was made very clear that minors agreement was void ab initio if i may briefly give you the facts of mohri bb versus dharmadas ghosh now herein mr dharmadas ghosh was the minor when he entered into this kind of agreement with a money lender now there are two persons you need to understand one yes dharmadas ghosh second was brahmodat third being kedarnath now this uh, uh, brahmodat was the money lender and kedarnath was basically brahmodat's attorney who was working on his behalf who was doing the transactions on behalf of brahmodat he was authorized to do those transactions so what happened dharmadas ghosh had mortgaged his property with kedarnath or basically he went to him and he uh, offered to mortgage his property in return of a certain amount of money 20000 uh, in those times it was a huge amount for that property kedarnath before he was before he could execute that uh, deed he got an intimation which was sent by dharmadas mother that see dharmadas ghosh was a minor because dharmadas ghosh had misrepresented his age to be a major so she sent an intimation to kedarnath that see dharmadas ghosh is a minor and whatever transaction you are entering into with him is at your own risk basically she tried to uh, caution him but kedarnath thought that he was very smart what he did he made dharmadas ghosh despite knowing despite getting the information from uh, the mother he made dharmadas ghosh sign a declaration wherein dharmadas ghosh declared that he was a major or he had come of age as we say when he was entering into such uh, agreement he he had put his signature so uh, and uh, kedarnath uh, gave him an advance uh, amount from the uh, from that uh, loan from that money dharmadas ghosh was the plaintiff in this case dharmadas ghosh was the plaintiff in this case and he approached the court he approached the court on the ground that uh, see i was a minor when i entered into this agreement with this uh, gentleman this money lender and uh, law says that i am not capable of entering into contract he was represented by his guardian his mother natural guardian and she uh, they went to the court the defendant the money lender he had few things to say first that he was uh, not aware of the fact that dharmadas ghosh was a minor which was disproved which was disproved 
right because there was an intimation which was sent to the money lender clearly mentioning clearly highlighting that he had given that particular uh, intimation he knew uh, the money lender was very clear the kedarnath who was representing the money lender he knew about the fact that he was a minor secondly then the money lender said that okay if the court is ready to give relief or remedy to dharmadas ghosh who was a minor then the court should also he basically prayed to the court that the court should also consider his interest and at least ask uh, dharmadas ghosh to repay that amount which had been advanced to him which had been forwarded to him by the money lender right now in such a situation the court had to take such action that basically in this case the court did not allow repayment court gave relief to the minor by cancelling the instrument saying that yes he was a minor he cannot be asked to no contract can be enforced against him because minor's agreement is void ab initio minor's consent is no consent so even if he signed that declaration that is not consider that is not to be considered fine now there were certain provisions i would first take you to those provisions then we can come back so if we see if you can see on your screen minor was given relief as the instrument that is the document legal document the mortgage deed was set aside under the old specific relief act 1877 defendant prayed for repayment of advanced money under sections 64 65 68 of the indian contract act and if after nothing worked for him nothing worked in his interest he claimed relief under section 41 let's see what what all these sections are dealing with and let's see why the court did not grant any relief to the defendant and granted uh, relief to the minor by cancelling the instrument section 64 of the indian contract act under which the defendant prayed for relief states or deals with a person who having the right to do so resigns a voidable contract he shall have to restore to the other party any benefit received by him under the contract restore also means restitution right restoration restitution that means if he is choosing to get this document declared as uh, void or invalid in the eyes of law it is his duty also to return the benefit which he has received 65 says a party receiving any benefit under a contract will have to restore it if contract becomes void or is discovered to be void now the court said how can we grant any relief under 64 and 65 because the mandatory prime one of the primary requirements of both section 64 and 65 is that party with whom you have entered into that contract should be competent so we are saying both the parties who have entered into such a contract should be competent but it's not the case here in mauri bibi because he was a minor dharmadas ghosh was a minor there were few other things which have been taken care of which had been observed by the court by the judicial committee of privy council in the judgment of mohri bibi versus dharmadas ghosh let's quickly have a look at them no estoppel against minor estoppel means once you have committed something you cannot step back from it right so the court in this case stated there cannot be any estoppel against a minor because minor is not stopped from setting a setting up the defense of infancy policy of law is to provide protection to persons below age from contractual liability the next thing which has been uh, highlighted is no liability in contract or in tort arising out of contract so there is this famous judgment uh, in english law johnson versus pi wherein an infant obtaining loan by falsely representing his it was held that an infant who had obtained a loan by falsely representing his age cannot be made to repay the loan of money in form of damages for deceit because this is a tort this is a tort so basically it means that 
minor is not competent to enter into a contract. So, under the garb of his liability under torts, you cannot enforce an otherwise unenforceable contract against him. The third important thing, the third important, very important doctrine which was discussed in Mohri Bibi and in uh, later cases also was doctrine of restitution. We just uh, saw this term, we just discussed about restitution in the previous slide. Restitution basically means to come back to the original position, to restore something to another person to whom that thing belongs. It says, if an infant has obtained property or goods as a result of misrepresentation of his age, he can be compelled to restore the same provided that the same is traceable in his possession. That is, he is still having the thing in his possession. Those that property, those goods are still in his possession and he has not done away with them. But if the same not, if the same is not traceable, he cannot be made to repay as it would amount to enforcing it. Right. And this doctrine of restitution was laid again in an English case, famous case of Leslie Limited versus Shell, which has been uh, mentioned in another judgment also, we will be moving to it. So, this was the status of doctrine of restitution as it stood then, when it was laid down in this English case of Leslie versus Shell. But in India, later on, different connotations have been given to this uh, doctrine of restitution. We will be proceeding to it, but starting from the beginning of the laying down of this doctrine as has stated in Leslie versus Shell, it meant that a minor can be compelled to restore what he has gained provided that property or good which he had gained from another person is traceable in his possession and if it is money, money can't be traced and in that situation he would not be compelled to be to return that thing. Right, because it would amount or it would tantamount to enforcing an otherwise void uh, agreement. Right. I was telling you about the different uh, uh, the different provisions which were being referred by the defendant in Mohri Bibi for claiming relief because doctrine of restitution was referred, the restoration part was referred under 64 and 65. So, I thought that I should first give you a brief glimpse of what restitution was. So, now coming back to the further provisions which defendant had referred to for getting the repayment of the amount advanced. Next was 68. 68 is claim for uh, necessaries or liability of a minor under uh, section 68. It says claim for necessaries supplied to a person who is incapable of contracting or on his account. If a person incapable of entering into a contract or any one whom he is legally bound to support is supplied by another person with necessaries suited to his condition in life, the person who has furnished such supplies is entitled to be reimbursed from the property of such incapable person. So, the defendant, the money lender said, if nothing else, if no 64, no 65, can I get relief under 68? Because I have provided the minor with something and now which was a necessity and uh, I should be reimbursed from his property. Now, the court said, what is the meaning of necessaries suited to minor's condition in life? Necessary means basic requirements. What kind of basic necessity you have provided the minor with? Now, section 68 is one of the forms of quasi-contract. In our last session of this course, we would be discussing the concept of quasi-contracts and we will get into the details of section 68 again. But for the time being, you need to understand that the court made it very clear that section 68 cannot come to your uh, rescue or cannot favor you if I may say because you have not provided the minor with any basic necessity which is suited to his condition in life. So, you cannot get any relief in a way under the Indian Contract Act. Now, what else is left? Now, he stated, okay, if Indian Contract Act cannot come to my rescue, 
can I get relief under section 41 of the specific relief act 1877? Because Mori Bibi's judgment is of 1903. At that time, we were having this uh, old specific relief act which was which came in force in 1877. Now we have a new act which has replaced the old specific relief act. So what the section 41 of the old specific relief act stated? It stated that on adjudging the cancellation of an instrument, the court may require the party to whom such relief is granted to make any compensation to the other which justice may require. Simply means if you are going to the court and you are claiming some kind of remedy from the court, if you have been benefited anyhow from that transaction, so before the court cancels that instrument, before the court grants you relief, you first have to restore, you first have to basically compensate the other person because you cannot be unjustly uh, benefited. So in uh, crimes, we uh, talk about this concept of double jeopardy. A person cannot be punished twice for the same act. So here, a, pun a person cannot be favored twice for the same act. So if you are cancelling the instrument, it would be in favor of that uh, uh, minor only. And if also you are uh, not, uh, and if you are letting the person, the incompetent person here uh, keep that property also with him that keep that money or keep that thing with him without restoring that benefit that will be like double uh, double favor right so the law law was very clear about it if you are going to the court you want to get it cancelled please first re return the benefit which you have received or just make any compensation to the other party which the which justice may require that is which the court thinks is uh, fitted suited for that case so basically ultimately no relief was granted to the defendant in mohri bibi now before i end this uh, particular uh, discussion on this judgment of mohri bibi versus dharmadas ghosh i would just like to highlight one thing you may be wondering that i told you that brahmodath was the money lender so he became the defendant Kedarnath was the attorney of Brahmodath. From where did, and Dharmadas Ghosh was the minor. So from where did this Mohri Bibi come, came into picture? Mohri Bibi was the wife of the money lender who was the defendant and she substituted him because when this matter went to the stage of, uh, uh, went to the privy council for the decision, till that time Brahmodath, the money lender, the defendant was no more. Therefore, he was substituted by his wife. So, Mori Bibi was the wife. Now, we had just uh, had a discussion about the doctrine of restitution as was laid down in the judgment of Leslie versus Shell. Now, Khangul versus Lakha Singh and, uh, and uh, Indian judgment of that time, it was very crucial also you can say, you can say criticized also you can say landmark judgment as well but what made it so important judgment that despite being such an old decision we are still discussing it because Mohri Bibi we know Mohri Bibi was that first judgment which said that minor's agreement is void ab initio but from where did this Khangul versus Lakha Singh uh, come into picture let's see in Khangul versus Lakha Singh the defendant who was a minor fraudulently concealed his age and contracted to sell a plot of land to the plaintiff. After having received the consideration of rupees 17,500, he refused to perform his obligation. That is, the other person has fulfilled the obligation, has fulfilled the promise, but when it came to you to fulfill your part of the obligation, you refused to perform the obligation. So, obviously, that other person, the other party does not have any other option but to approach the court. So, the plaintiff here approached the court and he prayed for recovery of the consideration advanced that is rupees 17,500. Now, Mohri Bibi had come into picture. Mohri Bibi said that yes, uh, if that be the thing. See, Mohri Bibi, the situation was that minor was not asked to return that amount to him because the thing was that the minor 
could have been compelled or could have been asked to compensate because the law clearly stated if you are going to the court for cancellation of the deed, the legal document, you have to compensate the other party. But you must be wondering that I did not mention this thing. That why under section 41 of then specific relief act the court did not grant any relief? The answer to that is that the money lender, the defendant was imputed with the knowledge that when he was entering into that, that transaction, that agreement with the minor, he was aware of the fact, very well aware of the fact that the other side, the other party was a minor. Still he chose to continue with this decision. The court said you cannot take advantage of your own wrong. You acted smartly. You did, you, despite knowing that he was a minor, you still wanted to end, do that transaction. Now you will have to face the consequences. The, the reason in that case was that otherwise he would, he would have got the relief. The defendant would have got the relief under section 41. Now here in Khangul versus Lakha Singh, you are clearly seeing that minor in this case was a defendant. He was not the plaintiff. So, 64, 65, 68 of the Indian Contract Act being ruled out, the only thing left was section 41 of the Specific Relief Act. Now, section 41 of the Specific Relief Act also did not come to uh, the relief here of the plaintiff as it did not deal with the situation where minor was defendant. We just saw here that under section 41, it was only dealing with the situation wherein a person is approaching the court, the, the minor here say is approaching the court for uh, cancelling of the instrument. Situation wherein minor is defendant was not being dealt anywhere, neither in Indian Contract Act nor under the Specific Relief Act. Nor was the principle laid down in Leslie held to be applicable in the case as it did not apply to cases involving money. Remember Leslie versus Shell doctrine of restitution, if the good or the property is traceable in possession of the minor, it has to be restored. But if, it, if the same is not traceable in the possession of the minor, minor cannot be compelled to restore it because it will amount to enforcing it. Right. So, even that doctrine of restitution as laid down in Leslie versus Shell did not come to the rescue or did not come to, uh, could not be applied in this case, if I may say. Now the judge, in the judge, now the judge in Khangul versus Lakha Singh was of the view that there should be greater scope of the doctrine of restitution in India because compared to England, that is in English law, because in former, that is in India, all agreements made by minor are void. Whereas in the latter, that is under English law, it was not the case. So, what happened in the judgment of Khangul versus Lakha Singh is that court went beyond the doctrine of restitution as was laid down in Leslie versus Shell and held that the minor, even if the minor is defended because he acted in a fraudulent manner, is supposed to restore the money which he had received from the plaintiff. So, minor was made to return that money back. Now, the, uh, the third case which I would like to highlight here is Ajudhya Prasad versus Chandanlal, which came after Khangul versus Lakha Singh, which was uh, 1920s judgment of Lahore High Court. This judgment was given by Allahabad, Allahabad High Court in 1937. Now, Khangul opinion was not followed in the judgment of Ajudhya Prasad versus Chandanlal. In this judgment, in this case, the facts were that the two minors had borrowed money under mortgage deed and they fraudulently concealed that they had a guardian appointed for them. That means these two minors, they have were more than 18 years of age, but less than 21. And they had hidden this particular fact from the other party when they had entered into this mortgage deed and had borrowed money. Now, the court held that where property is not traceable and only way to grant compensation would be by money decree. Decreeing the same would be equivalent to enforcing minors pecuniary that is monetary liability under contract 
which is void. That means in this judgment again Mori BB that is minus agreement is void ab initio and the concept the doctrine of restitution as was laid down in Leslie versus Shell had come into picture. Because in Leslie versus Shell also something which is not traceable in the position, uh, possession cannot be uh, cannot uh, minor cannot be compelled to restore it. Now I was telling you about the old uh, specific relief act provision under section 41. Section 33 of the specific relief act 1963 was the one which replaced which substituted section 41 of the old specific relief act 1877. So, you can say that it was the counterpart of section 41 of the old specific relief act. Now, it stated power to require power to require benefit to be restored or compensation to be made when instrument is cancelled or is successfully resisted as being void or voidable. So, you can see the first point of difference which you can make out between the section 41 of old specific relief act and the new provision uh, section 33 under specific relief act 1963 was that 41 of the old act was only restricted to a position where minor is going as a plaintiff and is praying for cancellation of instrument then the court could compel that minor to restore the benefit or compensate right now section 33 provided for two subsections the first was exactly same to what the position was in the old act 1877 the second subsection took care of a situation wherein minor was defendant that problem which was faced in the judgment of Khangul versus Lakha Singh because and in Ajudhya Prasad versus Chandan uh, also minors were defendant only right. Now it stated where a defendant successfully resists any suit on the ground that the agreement sought to be enforced against him in the suit is void by reason of his not having been competent to enter into contract which means that we are referring to a position say example that a minor is the defendant in the judgment uh, in, in that particular in a particular case and he is trying to claim in the court that the suit is void the suit which has been filed against him is void because of the reason that he was not competent to enter into a contract as per the terms of the Indian Contract Act 1872. And the court may, the relief which is being granted here is if when the minor is defendant that the court may if the defendant has received any benefit under the agreement from the other party require him to restore so far as may be such benefit to that party to the extent to which he or his estate has benefited thereby. So, if the minor or minors a minor has received some kind of uh, benefit personally or minors estate has been benefited out of uh, that uh, tra that transaction which had taken place minor will be asked to restore to that extent minor will be asked to restore the benefit back to the other party so this was an additional relief which came into picture courtesy section 33 specific relief act of 1963 now the last part of this session which is dealing with beneficial contracts. Now what if a contract is beneficial for the minor? What will happen in that situation? Right? Now here we were talking about those situations only where the other party is trying to enforce some kind of obligation against the minor because what Mori Bibi had laid down was uh, that only that when an obligation is being enforced against a minor then in that case uh, minor cannot be uh, compelled to do that act right. So as you can see on your screens law as laid down in Mohri Bibi deals with cases wherein a minor has been charged with obligations and other contracting party tries to enforce such obligation against the minor. 
But what about those contracts which have been made for the benefit of the minor? There are two examples which I thought of citing here. You can see on your screens. First is contract of marriage. If for the benefit of minor, a contract of marriage has been entered into on behalf of the minor, then it can be enforced against the other contracting party at the instance of minor, but not against the minor. The other party cannot enforce against cannot enforce any obligation against the minor, but if but if the terms are of benefit to the minor, minor can enforce it against other contracting party. Next is contracts of apprenticeship. Now there is an 1850 law in India, the Indian Apprenticeship Act, which provides for contracts which are for benefit of minors. Now contracts to contracts to be uh, basically these contracts are to be entered into by guardians on behalf of minor. There is this one judgment of Rajarani versus Prem Adib which is not actually dealing with this beneficial contracts but in this case if I may just very briefly tell you about what had happened. So uh, this lady Raj Rani, this, this uh, girl she was a minor when a director gave her, uh, when a person who was making a film, a filmmaker gave her a proposal that she should act in his film and uh, he would be uh, paying her a particular amount. So there was a contract which was uh, agreement I will say, I stand corrected, not a contract. So an agreement was entered into between the father of this girl, the minor and the filmmaker. But what happened later on the minor, the filmmaker, he chose someone else, chose another person for that role and that role was taken away from uh, this uh, girl, minor, right? Now, father approached the court, she re he represented this uh, minor, the guardian, right? He approached the court. But the court did not grant any relief. The court said two things. First, if we say that this uh, transaction was between the minor and the filmmaker, minor's consent is no consent, it amounts to nullity and uh, it is of no value in the eyes of law. So the filmmaker cannot be forced to uh, make this minor work in that uh, film, right? Can't be forced to take her in that film as a matter of right. And second situation, if one says that uh, the agreement was between father, father of that minor and filmmaker, then in that situation, it was a one-sided promise. What consideration was the father providing to the filmmaker? So keeping these two things in mind, the court held that no relief to be given to the minor, right? I would end my session by saying one last point in relation to effect of minor's agreement that minor cannot ratify an agreement also, right? Thank you.